Let's continue. Chapter 8, which tells of windmills, is the novel's most famous. Question, what is a symbol? If a rose were only to mean love, then it would be an equivalent term. Whenever we said rose, we would be saying love. That is not a symbol, but a substitution. A rose, however, means more, even connoting very specific and problematic aspects of love. Its color suggests an emotional experience. Its smell hints at seduction or pleasure. Its spines indicate danger, etc. Thus, a rose represents a love very different from that alluded to by, say, a lily or a gold ring. I have read many interpretations of Don Quixote's windmills. They derive from Dante's description of Satan as a windmill at the base of hell. They are the first example of machines in the novel's vision of an early industrial capitalism against which our agrarian, anarchist, or communist hero struggles. They are an external projection of the Hidalgo's deranged mind. All these hypotheses, and others, may be plausible. Since Cervantes has already subjected Don Quixote to several thrashings, literally millings, molimientos, it seems that the hero is always destined to be ground into pieces, as if the novel's point were Don Quixote's transformation into something new, maybe a new type of bread. But we have said that the windmills can symbolize many things. So what do you think? Let's get to the text. Dreams of Wealth and Power. The episode highlights the adventurism and rich booty that sustains military fantasy. See there, friend Sancho Panza, where 30 or more immeasurable giants come into view, with whom I mean to do battle and take all their lives, and with those spoils we shall begin to grow rich. Sancho tries to persuade Don Quixote to desist, and afterwards it's Sancho who gives us the first symbolic interpretation of the episode. Did I not tell your worship to mind what he was doing, that they were nothing but windmills, and that this was obvious to anyone who didn't have others like them spinning around in his own head? Don Quixote's response allows that the episode has to do with the uncertainty of war, and also with a common moral justification of war. The mills have tried to defeat him by directing evil arts against the righteousness of my sword. Next. Don Quixote and Sancho decide to head for Puerto Lapife, where they are sure to find many and various adventures due to its being a much transited place. Puerto Lapife lies south of Toledo on the royal road to Andalusia. Don Quixote tells a story which goes perfectly with the situation. Since he broke his spear during his meeting with the windmills, he plans to imitate Diego Pérez de Vargas, a knight who fought under Ferdinand III, the saint and who, according to legend, broke off the branch of an oak tree and pounded so many moors that he was surnamed Machuca, or the pounder. Sancho's response offers comical contrast. Straighten up a little, it looks like you're listing a bit, uh, which must be from the thrashing you took when you fell. Don Quixote insists that knights do not complain about their wounds, and when Sancho confesses that he would like to reserve his right to complain, for the first time in the novel, we see Don Quixote laugh. Don Quixote could not contain his laughter at the simplicity of his squire, and thus he declared to him that he might complain whenever and however he wanted. Let's stop here. This really is funny, the crazed, bruised hero laughing at the realistic logic of his squire. It's also significant. First, Don Quixote's laughter coincides not with anger, but with a magnanimous gesture. Second, he laughs at his squire while remaining ignorant of the fact that it is he who is most ridiculous. The relatively fluid and shared laughter deployed by Cervantes is quite different from the kind of sadistic or monolithic laughter imagined by, say, Thomas Hobbes or Plato. By the way, Cervantes takes advantage of his character's change of direction to introduce a salient aspect of Sancho. Besides being slow-witted, Sancho devotes himself to good food and, above all, wine. According to the narrator, Sancho drinks with such gusto that he would be the envy of the most self-indulgent tavern keeper of Malaga. Malaga again. So many references to Malaga. The next day, our knight instructs his squire on the laws of chivalry. In no way is it licit or permissible for you to assist me until thou hast been dubbed a knight. Sancho reacts comically. I'm a peaceful man and an enemy of getting into disputes and brawls. 
but our squire also indicates a familiarity with natural law philosophy. In fact, this might be the novel's first explicit reference to the famous neo-Aristotelian ideas maintained by the school of Salamanca. In what pertains to my own defense, I do not want much to do with your laws, because laws, both human and divine, allow everyone to defend himself against all who would harm him. It is no coincidence that the battle with the Basque takes place in this context. Note the cultural and historical significance of this scene. Don Quixote confronts a Basque lady on her way to Seville, where she was expected by her husband, who was departing for the Indies to take a very honorable post. We face a symbolic trajectory originating in the oldest and most northern place in Spain, which suggests the alleged nobility and racial purity of the Basques, and running down to Seville in the southwest corner of Andalusia, the richest city and main port at that time, from which Spain managed its colonial empire in the Americas. Another interesting detail here is that Don Quixote believes that the accompanying friars are part of the perceived threat for those black figures over there ought to be, and surely are, some sorcerers carrying off a captive princess in that carriage. Don Quixote's early battles suggest a topic much debated since antiquity. What defines just war? Wicked and monstrous people? Release forthwith the high princess that you hold by force in that carriage. If not, prepare to receive swift death as a just punishment for your evil deeds. Recalling Sancho's observation that every human being has the right to defend himself, then it is ironic and hilarious that the squire, dismounting smartly from his ass, sets about stripping the first monk unhorsed by Don Quixote. And Sancho pays a price. For the boys in the company of the friar thrashed him with kicks and left him lying flat on the ground. Meanwhile, Don Quixote, believing himself victorious, directs his predictable rhetoric to the lady in the carriage. Your beauteousness, madam, canst now dispose of thy person as thou pleaseth, for the insolence of thy captors lieth on the ground. Now a real Basque squire, traveling in the company of the carriage, becomes furious and challenges Don Quixote. First, it's funny how he mangles Castilian. Me, not a gentleman, I swear to God as Christian you lie. A battle ensues between them, as if they were two mortal enemies, and in the thick of things, Don Quixote again evokes his lady love. O oh, mistress of my soul, Dulcinea, flower of beauty, succor this thy knight. And just as the battle is about to be engaged, Cervantes pens the most famous cliffhanger in all of literature. But the difficulty here is that at this very moment and juncture, the author of this story leaves the battle incomplete.